What did Jesus really says part 5? 1.2.3, the, Son of God. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, himself tells us that miracles by themselves do not prove anything, for there shall arise false Christs, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, Matthew 24 verse 24. So even false Christs can supply great wonders and miracles of such magnitude that even the most knowledgeable among men shall be deceived. Jesus, peace be upon him, had a beginning, in the stable, and an end, and he gave up the ghost, Melchizedek, however, had no beginning of days nor end of life. Hebrews 7 verse 3. Solomon was with God at the beginning of time before all of creation, Proverbs 8 verse 22. Well then was Jesus, peace be upon him, the Son of God because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Let us read Luke 1 verse 67, Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost. Also, Luke 1 verse 41, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And, Acts 4 verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost said. Also Acts 13. 9, then Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. How about Acts 2 verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak. Is Jesus, peace be upon him, a God because he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb? If this is the case then John the Baptist should be a God also, as claimed in Luke 1 verses 13 to 15. Well then, is Jesus, peace be upon him, God because he performed his miracles under his own power while others needed God to perform them for them. Let us then read, Matthew 28 colon 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Luke 11 verse 20. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils. Matthew 12 verse 28 But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. John 5 verse 30 I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 10 verse 25 The works that I do in my Father's name. John 8 verses 28 to 29 I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Some will now say, but in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 we read, Christ, who is the image of God. Surely this makes Jesus God. Well then, why not read Genesis 1 verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. In John 8 verse 23 we read, And he, Jesus, said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Does this make Jesus, peace be upon him, a God? No. Why not read John 17 verse 14, I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, and John 17. 16, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. There are many other examples. In the Bible we read, God is not a man, that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good, Numbers 23 19. Now, do gods pray? Let us read Mark 14 verse 32, And he, Jesus, saith to his disciples, Sit ye here, while I shall pray. Also, Luke 3 verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass, that Jesus also being baptized, and praying, the heaven was opened. And, Luke 6 verse 12. And it came to pass in those days, that he went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. Further, Luke 22 verse 44, and being in an agony he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Matthew 26 verse 39. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. These verses do not speak of Jesus, peace be upon him, interceding, or consorting, or consulting, but praying. Jesus and his disciples are continuously being described in the Bible as, falling on their faces and praying, which is exactly the way Muslims pray today. They pray the way Jesus did. Have you ever seen a Christian fall on his face and pray as Jesus, Muhammad and all Muslims do? Mr. Tom Harper says, in fact, unless we are prepared to believe that his prayer dependence on God was nothing more than a sham for our edification, a mere act to set us a good example. 
It is impossible to cling to the orthodox teaching that Jesus was really God himself walking about in human form, the second person of the Trinity. The concept of God praying, let alone praying to himself, is incomprehensible to me. To say that it was simply the human side of Jesus talking to God the Father, rather than his own divine nature as Son of God, is to posit a kind of schizophrenia that is incompatible with any belief. In Jesus' full humanity, for Christ's sake, pp 42-43. All of mankind are the servants of God. If a man were to own another man then that man would be his servant. Obviously this servant would be held in a lower regard than this man's own children. We do not usually find people telling their sons, come here my servant, or, go over there my servant. Let us compare this with what God has to say about Jesus, peace be upon him Matthew 12 verse 18. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. Further, in the revised standard version of the Bible, Acts 3 verse 13 reads, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac. Hath glorified his servant Jesus, and Acts 4. 27, RSV, for of a truth against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. The actual Greek word used is pais, or pida, which mean servant, child, son, manservant. Some translations of the Bible have translated this word as son when it is attributed to Jesus and servant for most everyone else, such as the King James Version. While more recent translations of the Bible such as the Revised Standard Version now honestly translate it as servant, the RSV was compiled from the most ancient manuscripts by the most knowledgeable among conservative Christian scholars. The exact same word, peers, is attributed to Jacob, Israel, in Luke 1 verse 54, and translated as, servant, he hath helped his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy. It is also applied to King David in Luke 1 verse 69, and once again, it is translated as, servant, the house of his servant David, also see Acts for verse 25. However, when it is applied to Jesus, e.g. Acts 3 verse 13, now it is translated as, son. This fact is further emphasized by Jesus, peace be upon him, in John 20 verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Not only is God Jesus' Father, but he is also his God. Think about this carefully. Also notice how Jesus is equating between himself and mankind in these matters and not between himself and God. He is making it as clear as he possibly can that he is one of us and not a God. Okay. If Jesus and God are two distinct gods and one is greater than the other, my father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28, then this contradicts such verses as Isaiah 43. 10 to 11 and the very definition of the Trinity, see chapter 2.2.5, which includes the words, dot co-equality, in its definition, see chapter 2.2.8. However, if they are not two separate gods, but O-N-E God, as claimed by the Christians and Mr. J, then is Jesus, peace be upon him, praying to himself. Is, for instance, his mind praying to his soul? Matthew 11 verse 11, Verily I, Jesus, say unto you, Among them that are born of women there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Not even Jesus? Jesus, peace be upon him, was born of a woman. Job 25 verse 4, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Once again, Jesus, peace be upon him, was born of a woman. Shall we now apply this to him? Not as far as Muslims are concerned. Luke 2 verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and Hebrews 5. 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. If Jesus is God, then did God start out as an ignorant and savage God and then become a learned, wisdom, and prestigious, stature, God. Does God have to learn? Does God start out savage and increase in stature? Does God need to learn obedience to God? If there is only one God in existence, and this God is a trinity with three faces, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, required by Isaiah 43. 10 to 11, then is Jesus, peace be upon him, learning obedience to another side of his own personality. Mr. Tom Harper says, in fact, if you read Mark's whole gospel carefully you will discover that the disciples were far from recognizing the divinity later attributed to Jesus. The very ones who should have been most able to see through that disguise are at times depicted as dull-witted and even downright stupid, some scholars, indeed, have calculated that Mark deliberately showed the disciples in a rather bad light because he was conscious of a serious problem. 
if Jesus was the Son of God in the later, more orthodox sense, how was it that his closest associates the witnesses of his miracles and the confidants of his deepest teachings never knew who he was until well after the resurrection? For Christ's sake, pp. 59. Remember, most Christian scholars today believe that the authors of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke used the Gospel of Mark as the source document from which they obtained their material. In Grolier's Encyclopedia, under the heading, Mark, Gospel According to, we read. Mark is the second Gospel in the New Testament of the Bible. It is the earliest and the shortest of the four Gospels. Much material in Mark is repeated in Matthew and in Luke. Leading most scholars to conclude that Mark was written first and used independently by the other writers. But the Church will insist that it is necessary for Jesus, peace be upon him, to be the Son of God and to die on the cross as an ultimate sacrifice in atonement for the original sin. Otherwise they are all destined for hell. As Paul taught them, without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9 verse 22. Let us study Paul's claim. If the sin of one man can make all mankind sinners as claimed in Romans 5 verse 12, then. 1. This requires that all babies are sinners from birth and are only saved if they later accept the sacrifice of their Lord and are baptized. All others remain stained and destined for hell. Till recently, unbaptized infants were not buried in consecrated ground because they were believed to have died on the original sin. St. Augustine himself is quoted as saying, No one is clean, not even if his life be only for a day, a dictionary of biblical tradition in English literature, p.577. This, however, contradicts Matthew 19 verse 14, but Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not, to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. See also Mark 10 verse 14, and Luke 18 verse 16. So Jesus, peace be upon him, himself is telling us that children are born without sin and are destined for heaven without qualification. In other words, no one is born stained with an original sin. Once again, the teachings of Islam. 2. All the many millennia of previous prophets, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Noah, etc., and their people are all condemned to eternal hellfire simply because Jesus, the alleged Son of God, was not born yet. In other words, they have sin forced upon them, by Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22, and the chance for redemption withheld from them, by Jesus' late arrival after their death, Galatians 2 verse 16. In Romans 5 verse 14, Paul says, Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 4 verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath reason to boast, but not before God. Did Abraham or any of the other prophets ever preach the crucifixion? Did they preach the Trinity? We are asking for clear and decisive words and not personal forced interpretations of their words or hidden meanings for their words. If you are not sure then why not ask the Jews who we are told faultlessly transmitted two-thirds of the Bible to us. Many people do not bother to think about this. As long as they are going to heaven, what does it matter what happens to others? 3. What right did the prophets of God have to deceive their people and tell them that they would enter into heaven if they but kept the commandments? 4. What right did they have to teach them all of these commandments and the observance of the Sabbath and other hardships if the only way into heaven was the acceptance of a sacrifice that would not? occur till many hundreds of years after their death, or as Paul put it, a man is not justified by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 2 verse 16. 4. Explain Ezekiel 18 verses 19 to 20, Yet say ye, why? Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. This verse was revealed long before the birth of Paul and his claims of original sin and redemption. It clearly states that all mankind are not held accountable by God Almighty for the sin of Adam. Also read Deuteronomy 24 verse 16, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And Jeremiah 31 verses 29 to 30, In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
but every one shall die for his own iniquity, every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. And Ezekiel 18 verses 1 to 9, the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye, that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes? And the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments, to deal truly, he is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. And Micah 7 verse 18, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger for ever, because he delighteth in mercy. 5. Isaiah 43 verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. How is Jesus the Saviour if God himself denies this? Remember, we have already discarded the doctrine of Trinity. Even Jesus himself says, I will have mercy, and not sacrifice, Matthew 9 verse 13. Also read Isaiah 46 verse 9, I am God, and there is none else, I am God, and there is none like me, Deuteronomy 4 verse 35, the Lord he is God. There is none else beside him, Deuteronomy 32 verse 39, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me, 1 Kings 8 verse 60. That all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God, and that there is none else, Isaiah 44 verse 8, is there a God beside me? Yeah, there is no God, I know not any, Isaiah 45 verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God beside me, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, Isaiah 45 verse 21, and there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Saviour, there is none beside me, Isaiah 45 colon 22, I am God, and there is none else. Six, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. John 14 verse 23. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments, and abide in his love. John 15 verse 10. And, behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do, that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why kayest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19 verses 16 to 17. Jesus, who, refutes that he is even, good. This is a characteristic of a man. When you compliment a man, and this man is humble, he will say, Why are you complimenting me? I am not so good, I am just a humble man. This is how good and decent men speak. However, if Jesus, peace be upon him, is God then he must claim to be good. This is because God is ultimate good. If God claims not to be good then he will be a hypocrite and a liar which is impossible. Paul, a disciple of Jesus' disciple Barnabas, is quoted to have said that the law of Moses is worthless. Belief in the crucifixion is the only requirement, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, Galatians 2 verse 16. Also, in that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away, Hebrews 8 verse 13 as well as Mark 16 verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Romans 3 verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Jesus, peace be upon him, however, tells us that, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, 
he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 verses 18 to 19. Even James 2 verses 14 and 20 emphasizes that, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It comes down to this, whose words carry more weight with us, Jesus or Paul? Jesus, peace be upon him, himself never said, Believe in my sacrifice on the cross and you will be saved. He didn't tell this young man. You are filthy wicked and sinful and can never enter heaven except through my redeeming blood and your belief in my sacrifice. He simply said repeatedly, keep the commandments, and nothing more. If Jesus was being prepared and conditioned for this sacrifice from the beginning of time, then why did he not mention it to this man? Even when this man pressed him for more, Jesus only told him that to be perfect, he only needs to sell his belongings. He made no mention whatsoever of his crucifixion, an original sin, or a redemption. Would this not be quite sadistic of Jesus if Paul's claims are true, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified? If Jesus, peace be upon him, whole mission in life was to die on the cross in atonement for the sin of Adam, and if this was the founding reason why he was sent, would we not be justified in expecting him to spend night and day drumming this into the minds of his followers? Should we not expect him to speak of nothing else? Should we not expect him to spend night and day preaching that the commandments shall soon be thrown out the window? Galatians 3. 13, and faith in his upcoming crucifixion shall be the only thing required of them. Romans 3 verse 28. Should we not expect Jesus to echo the teachings of Paul who claims Jesus was preaching these things to him in visions? Should we not expect Jesus to tell everyone he meets, the commandments are worthless? I shall be dying on the cross soon. Believe in my sacrifice and you shall be saved. Is this not dictated by plain logic? Notice how Paul claims that, no, flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. No means none. Paul makes no exceptions whatsoever here. What this means is that even the young man who Jesus told to keep the commandments and to sell his belongings cannot be justified by simply following these commands of Jesus, peace be upon him. Did Jesus then forget to remind this young man that he cannot be justified by following Jesus' command, keeping the commandments and selling his belongings? Also remember our comments about the prophets of God. Are they all going to hell? Does any Christian today place the same emphasis on the commandments of their Lord, Jesus, peace be upon him, that the Bible states he did, and died doing? No. Christianity has now been, spiritualized, by Paul, and the path to heaven is now through a single trivial belief that Jesus himself never even mentioned. While the commands of Jesus have now been totally ignored. 7. If a man were to steal from my home in New York City, and the police were to capture him. If I were to then say, I am a very jealous man. I want you to not only place this man in jail, but all of his kinfolk in Ohio, Kansas, California, and China are to be placed in jail with him. I want the child which is in his pregnant wife's womb to also be condemned to life imprisonment as well as all his future generation till the end of time. Which are all to live and die in jail. Would this be called heavenly justice? Should I then be called the most just man on earth? When Paul alleges that God holds all of humanity responsible for the single sin of one man, Romans 5 verse 12, is this justice? Is this our perception of God? Continuing our example, if I were to come after about 40 years, after many of these people had already died in prison, and were to claim that I was now ready to be merciful but that I could not simply forgive and forget but must take my five-year-old sinless child and have someone whip him, kick him, spit on him. humiliate him, and then kill him in the most gruesome, humiliating, and drawn out way I know how in front of many people and only when he was in heaven could I forgive them. Would this be the ultimate show of mercy? Think about these allegations which are presented against God Almighty by Paul. 8. Jesus, peace be upon him, contradicts Paul, the inventor of the notions of original sin and redemption. By telling us that in order to be perfect, a man need only keep the commandments of Moses and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor. Matthew 19 verses 16 to 21. Having done this Jesus, who would consider a man perfect? Now the question arises, if I am perfect, then what does my faith yet lack? 
Answer, nothing. There is no need for the belief in the original sin or the crucifixion. This is exactly the teachings of the Apostle Barnabas, the teacher and benefactor of Paul, who Paul later looked down upon, in his gospel as well as the teachings of the Muslims' cure. 9. In every religion of mankind there are believers and sinners. Each religion also has guidelines for the transition from the domain of a sinner to the domain of the believer. For instance, in Judaism, the guideline for this transition is the commandments of Moses. Any Jew found respecting these commandments is regarded by them a believer. Similarly, Paul alleges that the guideline for this transition is the faith of Jesus Christ, Galatians 2 verse 16. What does Paul mean by this? He obviously does not mean the belief in the Trinity since, as we have already seen, see details below. The Trinity was not invented by his church until long after his death and is nowhere to be found in the Bible. He also does not mean by the faith of Jesus Christ, the faith that Jesus, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, practiced and taught his followers to practice. Which is the law of Moses since in this same verse he casually sweeps the law of Moses and Jesus under the carpet with the words, a man is not justified by the works of the law. Does Paul then mean by the words the faith of Jesus Christ, the belief in his miracles, his true prophethood, and his piety and sinless nature? No. Because this definition would make Muslims Christians too. Does any Christian claim that Muslims are devout Christians and deserving of salvation? No. What then does Paul mean? What he means is what his church has been preaching for close to 2,000 years now. To believe that a sinless Jesus died on the cross in atonement for the original sin Adam which we have all inherited. In other words, if you have faith in the original sin and the atonement then you will be saved. You need nothing else. But Jesus, peace be upon him, himself did not believe this. This can be clearly demonstrated by reading Matthew 9 verse 13 where Jesus said, But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy, and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Jews were admonishing Jesus for eating with sinners. Jesus' reply clearly divided his people into sinners and righteous people. The righteous are clearly free from the original sin. Jesus was not calling them because they had already been saved. He was only calling the sinners. But Jesus had not been crucified yet. He also never mentioned either a crucifixion or an atonement to them. So these people are described by Jesus himself as righteous without their having believed in the original sin or the atonement. This observation is further reinforced by reading Matthew 19 verses 16 to 21. Did Jesus intend to teach his followers one thing during his lifetime and then come back in visions to Paul and teach them to totally disregard everything he had taught them after his death? Not according to him. Jesus said, Matthew 5 verses 17 to 19, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Also notice Jesus' words, I will have mercy, and not sacrifice. 10. Paul himself is not even sure WHO is responsible for the original sin he invented and claimed we have inherited. He tells us in Romans that Adam alone was responsible, Romans 5 verse 12, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, and also 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. However, in 1 Timothy 2, 14 Paul tells us something completely different. He claims that Adam was not deceived, he was not the transgressor, rather, Eve alone was deceived and was the transgressor. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, Eve, being deceived was in the transgression. Unless we are willing to continually keep coming up with new, abstract, and hidden meanings for practically every single verse of the Bible, then it becomes quite clear to an unbiased mind that Paul was making these things up as he went along. 11. In the Q&A we are told that Adam, peace be upon him, did indeed repent. Adam received the words given to him by Allah, and was inspired to ask for forgiveness with them. These words of forgiveness are mentioned in Surah Al-Aif, 23, they said, Our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. 
if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, we will certainly be of the losers. Allah accepted Adam's turning to him a, forgave him, for he is always forgiven a. Al-Baqarah, 237. So Adam received a revelation from God showing him how to repent and he did so. God Almighty did not mandate a gruesome and torturous death for, his only begotten son or anything else. He simply accepted Adam's repentance and relented. This is true mercy. Christians are taught that to enter heaven they only need to believe in the single fact that Jesus, peace be upon him, died on the cross for their sins and become baptized. However you define, baptized, God's commandments are considered worthless, Romans 3 verse 28. Christians are not ignorant people. However, they have all been taught to have two different standards of logic. One for the Bible and one for everything else. They would consider any similar claim from anyone else preposterous. If they were told that the United States government was passing out free mansions, checks for $100 million and a guaranteed, good life, to all comers if they would only believe that previous Americans died to give them their freedom. Then the person making this claim would be labeled a crazy man. A Christian gentleman from Canada once quoted John 3 verses 14 to 15 in an attempt to prove that Jesus, peace be upon him, died and was resurrected. The actual words are, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Anyone who would simply read the above verses carefully will notice that they never mention either a crucifixion or a resurrection. They also do not mention an original sin or an atonement. They do not even mention a son of God. So, what do they say? They say exactly what Muslims say, that Jesus was not forsaken to the Jews, but was raised by God. I cursed them because they proudly, but falsely, said, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They did not kill him as they claimed, nor did they crucify him, but they killed and crucified a man whom Allah made to resemble Jesus, so they thought the person who was killed was Jesus. Those Jews who claimed to have killed him and those Christians who surrendered him over to them are in doubt and confusion regarding the matter. They have no knowledge, but make guesses that are of no worth against the truth. Truly, they did not kill Jesus nor crucify him. Instead, Allah saved Jesus from their plot and raised him in body and spirit to himself. Allah is mighty in his dominion and nothing can overpower him. He is wise in his planning, decisions and laws. The Qur'an, Al-Nisa, 4157-158 This is what the Gospel of Barnabas says too. If you were to read the Gospel of Barnabas, see chapter 11, you would find that when Jesus was allegedly crucified, all of the faithful were weeping in the streets and they began to have serious doubts about his truthfulness and his true prophethood. They said, Jesus told us that he would not die until just before the end of time. Now he has been crucified by his enemies. Was he a liar? By the way, Muslims also believe that Jesus, Pooh, will return to earth just before the end of time and will guide mankind to the final message of God. The message of Islam. The same gospel then goes on to describe how Jesus returned a few days later with four angels to the house of his mother Mary and was seen by the apostles. He described how God had saved him from the hands of the Jews and had made it so that Judas resembled him and was taken in his place. He told them that those who believe in him must believe that everything he had preached to them was true. If they believed that he was raised by God and not forsaken to the Jews to be crucified, then they would have eternal life. Is this not what the verses say? Please read chapters 5.10 and 12. It is amazing how people allow others to tell them what is and isn't a genuine gospel without asking for any proof whatsoever. The Gospel of Barnabas is not the only gospel which confirms most of the teachings of the Qur'an. There is also, the Shepherd of Hamas. In 1922, a third-century papyrus manuscript of, the Shepherd, surfaced and once again it confirmed the teachings of the Qur'an, and once again. This gospel was destroyed and hidden from the masses. During the first centuries AD, both of these books were considered authentic and canonical and preached as the true word of God.